Well, good evening, church. I'm Pastor Vern. It's good to have you with us tonight here online. We are, uh, of course, this is Christmas Eve. This is the end of the Advent season. And throughout Advent, we have been talking about the reasons why Jesus came. So that's what I'm going to finish talking about tonight, looking at some of the reasons why Jesus came. And the message tonight is this. Jesus came to bring the offer of a new start. Have you ever needed a new start? Have you ever needed a new beginning? You ever felt like, you know, I just like to start, you just, you just go back to the beginning, do this all over again, maybe do some things a little differently? Well, you know, there's, there's things we can't go back and undo or do differently. But Jesus says you can have a new start starting right now. If you want a new beginning, he's offering that to us right now. So we're looking at today, I want to ask you a question. What would it take for you to willingly leave your wealthy suburban home with its five bedrooms, five baths, pool, home theater room, etc., to move into a one-room studio with no hot water, spotty internet connections, and a noisy bar below. What would it take for you to do that? Well, what if one of your children, your son, your daughter, was not doing well, and they couldn't come home to you or wouldn't come home to you. So you decided to move to them. You decided to give up all of the luxuries that you have, all of the comforts that you have, and you move into the one room studio just to be close to your son or daughter so they could know how much you love them, how much you want them, and you would have the opportunity to invite them into your heart. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus left the glories of heaven, the splendor of heaven, all the beauty of heaven. He left his throne to come to be with us. Eugene Peterson in the message said it famously, Jesus has moved into the neighborhood. He's moved into your neighborhood. He's moved into every neighborhood. And he did that for one reason. Because as Pastor John said, he loves us. And he loves us so much that giving all of that up for a time to come and to be with us, to invite us to know him and to know his love for us was well worth it for him. It was more than worth it for him. Jesus lived here. There's no doubt about that. Historians, even historians that do not believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, they understand that Jesus was real. Jesus lived. He really did walk this planet. He did really uh, eat and talk and, and have friends and move around. And he was a real person. He was a real part of history. And of course, we Christians believe that he also really existed before he came here and that he really rose from the dead after he was crucified on the cross. But the question is, I've already kind of answered it. Why? What are the reasons that he came? And I might ask you that, and if you've been around church a long time, you might say, well, he came to pay for our sins. And you'd be absolutely correct. But, you know, there's so much more to the reasons why Jesus came. And as I say, we've been looking at that through this Advent series. You look at the Christmas story, and we're offered a number of reasons for Jesus coming. An angel told Joseph that Jesus had, was coming to save people from their sins. There you go. The Magi believed that he came to be the king of the Jews. Gabriel told Mary that Jesus was coming to reign over a kingdom that would never end. And Simeon, upon seeing the infant Jesus, said he was here to bring light to the Gentiles and glory to Israel. I, I sum all of that up by saying Jesus came to change the world. And he did. And we're still living in a world that Jesus changed. And, and I, I'd love to go off on this tangent, but I won't because it's Christmas Eve and, and that's not why we're here. But, you know, we're still living the blessings and the benefits of the fact that Jesus came and changed the world. And he changed a lot of our own personal worlds as well. Jesus had a number of statements to make about why he came. He said, I've come to fulfill the law. Pastor John preached on that. I've come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. I've come to seek and to save the lost. I've come to do the will of the one who sent me. I've come to give people life to the full. And I've come to bring light to the darkness. And I'm going to pause here a minute. And I'm going to light the Christ candle. 
because this candle represents the light that Jesus brought to the world. And a little later on, we're all going to light our candles, and they represent the light that Jesus brings to the world. There's one really good place to hear Jesus talk about why he came. And that's in the scripture I want to read for you. It's in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. It says there, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 61, and he's saying that this scripture was being fulfilled even as the people listened. Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah who was inaugurating a brand new day through his coming. Jesus was about 30 years old when he preached that message. He was at the front end of his public ministry, which would only last three years. But he started something that continues today. And it's the reason why we've come here to celebrate his birth and all that he has done and all that he is doing. Because Jesus did change the world. And Jesus has changed many of our personal worlds. He's changed my personal world. And he was anointed by God to do just that. And in this message, he states very clearly five reasons for his coming. Why did Jesus come? First of all, he came to encourage the poor. To encourage the poor, including but not only the materially poor. It's a wonderful part of the Christmas story that, that Jesus, when, when the Godhead chose to send Jesus here to the earth, that they chose a poor couple to have him born into. Isn't that remarkable? Not a wealthy couple, not even a middle-class couple, but Mary and Joseph were a poor couple. And we know that because when they took Jesus a little later to be dedicated at the temple, all that they could offer at that temple was a couple of little birds. It was the poorest offering anybody could offer. They didn't have much. They weren't wealthy, they weren't noted, they weren't famous, they weren't, you know, held up in society for any special reason. They were just a, a poor couple, but they were righteous. They were seeking God's will for their lives. They were, they were dedicated to the Lord, and God blessed them by allowing Mary to give birth to Jesus. God encourages the materially poor. When Jesus saw a poor widow giving her offering at the temple, he made sure that his, his followers who were sitting with him, they noticed her too. He pointed her out and he honored her for her giving. Not all of the wealthy people who were giving. He honored the poor woman. But the poor he's talking about here are not the materially poor only. He's talking about the spiritually poor. In fact, the word he uses for poor in that scripture doesn't mean those who have little. It means those who don't have anything, those who have nothing to bring. We just sang a song that said, I have nothing to bring except my hallelujah. That's the idea here. Jesus is saying, I've come to, to give good news to the people who know that they're spiritually poor, that the spiritually they're empty without God, that they have nothing to offer God. And they are completely open, therefore, to whatever God wants to give to them. They are poor in spirit. You know, it takes a lot of humility to acknowledge that I am poor in spirit, that, that on my own, I don't have, I, I'm not good, I'm not perfect, I'm not holy, I'm not righteous, I don't, I don't have the means to please God unless God gives that to me, unless God enters into my life and changes it. 
That's what it means to be poor in spirit. And if you are poor in spirit and you know that, Jesus has good news for you. He's come for you. Secondly, he says, I've come to free the imprisoned. Jesus has good news for the prisoners. He's come to declare freedom. He's not advocating that, that physical prison doors be unlocked and, and all of the convicted criminals be released and, and let go. That's not what he's talking about. Clearly, if that was what he was talking about, he had a perfect opportunity to demonstrate that. You know that when Mary became pregnant with Jesus, Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with a cousin of Jesus. John, the one we know as John the Baptist. Well, do you know, and many of you I'm sure do, that later on after John had been preaching about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ, he was in prison because he had the, the gall, the courage to speak out to the king and tell the king that he was living a terribly sinful life. That's not a safe thing to do to the king. And it wasn't safe for John the Baptist. King Herod had him arrested and had him in prison. And while John is languishing in prison, he is starting to wonder, what have I given my life to? Has it been right? Have I been right? I have believed that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ we've been waiting for. Is that right? And so he sends some of his friends to ask Jesus, are you the one we've been waiting for? Or should we be looking for somebody else? And Jesus sends back a reply. He says, you tell John this, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, John, Jesus could have gone to that prison and he could have opened those doors. He could have sent angels to open those doors to free John and let John go. Happened later with Peter. In the Acts, we're told that Peter was in jail and an angel came and opened the doors and, and walked him out. But Jesus didn't do that for John. Why not? Because Jesus knew that John was going to experience so much, something so much greater, so much better. And because this was not the kind of prison that Jesus was, had come to free people from. There's another kind of prison, and it's one that all of us experience, and it's the prison of sin. The Bible says that, that we are slaves to sin. That's as good as being imprisoned to sin. And if you've ever tried to get free of a sin in your own life without God's help, you know that that's hard, impossible, but Jesus says, I've come to set you free from the prison of sin. If you know that you struggle with sin and you want to be set free, Jesus has good news for you. Jesus said also that he came to help the blind to see. On several occasions, Jesus literally did just that. He took a person who was blind and he gave them the ability to see and those miracles got the attention of people. But those miracles were meant by Jesus to help us all understand that we need to see things differently. We need to have our sight renewed. We don't see things the way that we ought to unless we see them the way Jesus does and only he can help us to do that. When Jesus talks about this, he says something interesting. He actually doesn't say that he's come to give us a new way of looking at things. He says he's come to recover the sight of the blind. Recover. The word recover makes me think that Jesus has come to help us see things the way they're meant to be again. That we've lost the ability to see clearly. And he's restoring that. And that makes me think of the Garden of Eden before sin. It makes me think of this place where human beings had a perfect relationship with each other and with God. They had no struggle with sin until they did fall to temptation and sin. Before that, their life was, was easy and it was free of shame and guilt and pain and agony and, and difficulty and toil and all of that. Their conversations with each other were open and, and honest and vulnerable and transparent. Their, their conversations with God were the same until sin 
corrupted all of that. And how did Satan tempt Adam and Eve to sin? He said, look, look at this. Look at this and, and understand that God is trying to keep something good from you. Not true, but that's what he told them. And they looked and the Bible says, and the, the fruit looked pleasing to the eye. You see, their eyesight was already being corrupted. And our sight, eyesight is corrupted. You might go to, to an optometrist and they might say, well, you have 20-20 vision. But that's just physical vision. What we need to have healed is the vision of our hearts. The things that we see with the heart. And Jesus says, I've come into the world so the blind will see. And then fourth, he says he's come to alleviate pressure. He's come to set the oppressed free. You look at the word oppressed and you see right in it the word pressed and that's what it means. It means to be weighed down, to, be, to feel under it, to feel like there's a heavy weight on your chest and it's hard to breathe and you know that is not the kind of life that God ever intended for you to live. That pressure might come from things you can't control like an illness you or a loved one is suffering from or your fears related to that. It might be from the way others are treating you or your belief that things are never gonna get better for you. The pressure might be from your thoughts constantly reminding you of things that you've done wrong or ways you've messed up or the messages you get that you need, to, to th you need this or that to be happy. And in fact, you need more of this, you need more of that or the newest this or the newest that. And if you can't get it, peace and happiness will keep eluding you. These are all the kinds of pressures that we feel. And Jesus came to lift them all off of us. Jesus came to tell us we don't have to be afraid but if we are, we need to know that he is here with us in the storm. He came to tell us that there is hope for the future, that we don't need stuff to make us happy, that we can be rid of our guilt and our shame and that the priorities of the world are not the priorities of God and we don't need to give our lives over to them. He came to tell us we can find our contentment in a relationship with him and in loving relationships with each other. Jesus wants to relieve you with the pressure of trying to be perfect. He wants to relieve you with the pressure of trying to make up for your sins. He wants to relieve you with the burden of thinking that you are responsible for saving the world or even a part of it. He wants to relieve you with the pressure of trying to prove that you are worth being loved. Jesus says to all of us, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then the fifth thing that Jesus is offering us here in this passage, he's offering us a new start. Jesus says he's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's a reference to the year of Jubilee. And you probably read about this in Leviticus just this very week. That was a very poor joke. I'm not, I would be surprised if any of you read Leviticus this week. If you did, I would love to talk to you after the service. In Leviticus chapter 25, we read about the year of Jubilee, and it's an incredible thing. In the year of Jubilee, all debts are canceled. Wouldn't you like that to be January 2024? <laughs> all debts are canceled. If you sold your land or your parents sold their land to somebody in order to pay off debts or pay the bills or make ends meet, in the year of Jubilee, which was to come every 50 years, the people who bought that land, they had to give it back to you. They just had to give it back to you. You got it back, free and clear, it's yours again. The debt is erased, it's canceled, it's forgiven. In the year of Jubilee, if you had sold yourself into slavery in order to pay your debts or to make ends meet or to survive, in the year of Jubilee, you were given your freedom. You were free to go. And Jesus says he's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor or the year of Jubilee. He's announcing that the debt we owe to God for the sins we've committed against him is canceled. It's erased. It's forgiven through him. It's the offer of a new start. Jesus' birth would lead to Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection and by faith in what he's done for us, 
We who are poor can be made rich. We who are slaves to sin can be set free. We who are blind can look up in hope. We who experience life's pressure can find relief and help. And we who know we could never pay off our debt to God for the life he's given us can now know we don't have to because Jesus has come to do that for us. Why did Jesus come? So much to say about that. I'm going to close with this, something that the Apostle Paul wrote about the reason for Jesus coming in Galatians 4. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Jesus came to tell us that no matter how much we have or don't have, we are precious in God's sight. Jesus came to set us free from the sins that enslave us. Jesus came to help us see things the way they're supposed to be, the way God sees them. Jesus came to ease the burdens we carry. He came to tell us that through trusting in him, all is forgiven and we really can have a new life. And he came to invite us to become his brothers and sisters by faith. These are the gifts that Jesus brought on Christmas Day. Let's pray. Father, we, it just doesn't seem like enough to say thank you for sending your son Jesus to do all of that and more for us, but we do say thank you. And we do praise you for all that we receive through Christ, your son. Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening tonight who has not received Jesus as their own Savior and experienced the gifts and the blessings of that relationship that you would speak to them tonight and move them in their own heart to offer themselves up to you, to get free of their sin, to receive your love and the new life that you offer. And I pray that you will help all of us this Christmas weekend to appreciate once again the depth of your love for us and all that you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we turn the lights up and blow out our candles, I want to remind you, Jesus said, I have come to bring light to the darkness. He also said, you are the light of the world. We're to take the love, the grace, the mercy, the hope, the peace that we receive from Christ and we're to share it with the whole world. Take a look around. Hold your candles up and take a look around you. This is Jesus in us at work, represented by this light. When you leave here tonight, take the light and the love of Christ with you. Okay, we can have the lights come up. Here's the way you blow out your candles. Put a hand in front of it and blow. That way you don't blow wax on anybody in front of you. Thank you for being here tonight. Go in the hope and the peace and the joy and the love of Christ. Merry Christmas, everybody. God bless you.